my name is Giselle. This is Slow Food Live. This is part of our partnership this fall with 10 Speed Press and Clarkson Potter. We have had the absolute delight of welcoming a stellar roster of authors, of cookbook authors to Slow Food Live. And Kathy Irway is joining us today to talk about a recipe from her book, Sheet Pan Chicken, which I'll throw a link in for just in a second. And we're really happy to have you. Kathy will tell you more about herself. We're really happy to have this partnership with 10 Speed Press. It has been a wonderful journey into a handful of different locations and food cultures and dishes. And I'm gonna hand it over to you from here. Kathy, thanks so much for joining us today. And we'll tell us more about yourself and then we'll jump into some cooking. Sounds great. Thank you so much, Giselle. And I just have to say, thank you guys so much for coming tonight for joining and thank you so much for Slow Food. I'm really honored to be part of this great demo series. Um, I looked at the lineup and it's so awesome. Um, so coming up, I saw there's Hawa Hazan who's doing a cooking demo on the 13th, I think, um, but definitely check out the roster. There's only a, a few left. And of course, thank you so much for joining tonight. I know it's a, it's been a little bit of a crazy day, crazy year, but I think the important thing is that everybody has to eat. So, <laughs> We should really just take care of ourselves and remember to eat well and treat ourselves by eating well. And um, I'm so excited to demonstrate this recipe from my new book, Cheap Pan Chicken, which has 50 recipes with chicken on a sheet pan, <laughs> of all things. Um, and I had a lot of fun writing this book. Um, one of the themes that sort of plays out in it is that I try to reimagine a favorite dish of mine that doesn't traditionally um, belong on a sheet pan um, for the sheet pan. And I actually asked a, a number of contributors to um, if they had a recipe they would love to contribute. And a bunch of them took that similar route as well. So they like translated a dish of a beloved dish from their culture for the sheet pan. So that's basically the gist of this dish that we're gonna talk about tonight and we're gonna eat. And uh, I, it's probably the least likely dish, I think that could have been made for a sheet pan. Um, it's not your typical sheet pan dish where you fill the whole pan with like everything you're gonna eat that night. But I was actually really inspired to do it because I had such a great time doing a similar dish so let's kind of rewind a little bit. Um, I've been a food writer with a, a blog called Not Eating Out in New York since 2006. And then I, um, I really wanted to explore and write about the food of my mother's homeland, which is Taiwan. And it finally, I finally got a book for it in 2015. I finally got a book for it. I finally <laughs> published a book that I've been trying to write for a long time about it in 2015. So it's called The Food of Taiwan. Um, not a very creative title, but that's what it is. And so one of the dishes that was really fun for me to make was uh, a cold noodle, very simple cold noodle dish with a uh, shredded chicken, sh shredded chicken breasts, I should say. And while cooking the chicken, you know, the traditional ways you would do that would be, um, if you don't have a leftover roasted chicken, would be to, you know, steam it, you know, steam a chicken breast or maybe poach it. Um, but when I steamed it, I find that I had all this wonderful juices, like chickeny juices from the from the liquids. And I would use that and I, I would repurpose that juice or just kind of salvage the juice and put it into the sauce that would be mixed up with these cold noodles. The cold noodle um, sauce for this dish in the food of Taiwan was a more of like, a little bit of a traditional sesame paste based sauce with a little bit of garlic and ginger, soy sauce, a little bit of vinegar, and a little bit of sweetness. So it was called, you know, just long men, which means uh, cold noodles in Chinese. Um, so backing up, I just kind of had that nugget of wisdom. I was like, oh, if I'm ever going to make chicken for a, a cold dish with like a sauce, I'm just gonna really try to take advantage of all the cooking liquids wherever I can. So fast forward, I'm working with 10 Speed on a chicken cookbook. And at the same time, I also have been writing a column for Taste. Now Taste is a magazine 
Um, you can find that at tastecooking.com. That is, uh, it, it is underneath the umbrella of the random penguin, penguin random house uh, publishing ha uh, house. Yeah, publishing house. <laughs> um, so basically I've been writing a column called Know Your Chicken that has a different take on chicken in each uh, piece. And I, um, I expounded upon this dish that we're gonna make tonight, which is called Bang Bang Chicken in uh, a story there called Bang Bang Chicken's Identity Crisis. But the gist of the story is that this is a classic Sichuan dish and it's also known in English as Bon Bon Chicken, I should say. So B-O-N, B-O-N Chicken and Bang Bang Chicken uh, is referring to the same dish from Sichuan province in English. Um, <clears throat> and it consists of usually a poached or steamed chicken breast that before you shred it apart, you, you take a, a wooden uh, stick or hammer or cudgel and you just kind of bang it first. So I'm using two chops, but you kind of like bang it first, which we're gonna do in a few minutes, um, to kind of loosen up the muscles and then you can shred it more easily. So you get that kind of like polio string cheese effect <laughs> with your chicken meat. And that's so that once you add the sauce, it gets, you get like the most saturation of the delicious sauce into the chicken meat. So it's a really smart kind of uh, cooking tip embedded in the name of the dish. Um, and I wanted to recreate it for the sheet pan because even though the traditional way of poaching and, or steaming chicken is super delicious, and it keeps your chicken nice and moist and juicy. And I know that's like a big concern if you're using chicken breasts, you don't wanna overcook it. Um, I felt that I can utilize um, the juices that run on the sheet pan in my sauce and unlike with poaching. And I can also use that crispy skin that we're gonna get from roasting the chicken with the skin on, a skin on chicken breasts and have that as a topping because Traditionally, it's really nice to have a little bit of fried shallots. In this recipe, I had a little bit of um, peanuts, chopped up peanuts um, as a crunchy topping. But we're also gonna have the chicken skin. So all that said, we're gonna start out with a couple of split chicken breasts. And this is like a cut of a chicken, I think that is really underrated. It's basically the bone in, skin on chicken. So here, this is, um, this is actually from Bell and Evans, um, which is like a, 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 you know, a chicken uh, producer that is in my area, but there's many others. I know Springer Mountain Farms has, has some great chicken. Um, I'm sure Giselle can speak to a lot of the farmers that they work with to um, recommend some brands in your area if you don't have those two brands. Um, so what I'm doing right now is that I'm kind of like rubbing my fingers underneath the skin and loosening it away from the meat. So see that like kind of like bag of meat <laughs> or of skin that I created. So when you do that before you roast it, you kind of are encouraging the skin to crisp up more. You're, you're taking it away from being flush against the meat. So flush against the moisture of the meat so that hopefully it'll like, it'll be dry enough that it'll crisp up on its own and puff up too. So when I when I tend to roast these, I see a lot of bubbles, which is what you want to see. Because the whole point of doing this is that we want to get, we want to have some crispy skin to work with and have that as a bonus in our bang bang chicken. So I'm just like rubbing around the chicken. And now we're ready to just gently season the chicken. Um, so in Traditional, in traditional, in Chinese cooking, you use like white pepper instead of black pepper when you're just, when you're working with uh, light colored food. So in eggs, scrambled eggs, maybe fish, a white colored fish, and chicken, which is the white meat. You, uh, it's just kind of like the the standard bearer is white pepper, so that you don't have these flecks of black. Um, I know that's like, you know, not important in, in Western cooking, but it's just something I picked up uh, over the years. And I, I just, I kind of like having a, a thing of white pepper around. It's usually finely ground when you get it, but you can all, always get like, if you see like white peppercorns, 
you can buy those and put them in a, a spice grinder or pepper grinder. So I'm adding salt to these. And I'm just gonna kind of get all the salt on the sheet pan. No sense in messing a bowl when you can just do this on the sheet pan. Okay, so I'm making sure that the skin doesn't, you know, separate completely, doesn't run away from the chicken breast or the meat itself. I'm just kind of placing it back on there. And you just want to get a little bit of oil. Now you could use olive oil, you could use any oil, and any neutral oil, just to make sure that it doesn't stick too much. It gets nice and glossy on the, or not gloss, glossy, but uh, crispy on the top. I'm going to use a little bit of sesame oil, toasted, toasted Asian sesame oil. Um, it's just, a, it, it'll add a little bit more flavor. It's, it kind of marinates the meat with flavor as much as adds that fat that you need to have when roasting it anyway. And when you cook this, when you roast this, you're really going to smell the wonderful smells while it's roasting. And you're going to, uh, I mean, it's, it's really an amazing thing. I really think that roasting chicken and like one of the huge uh, advantages of basically are one of the bonuses of every dish in this recipe and, and every recipe in this book is that you get that olfactory bonus while everything is roasting together. And it's really, it's really just a nice thing. Each, each recipe in this book is pretty quick to make, but because it's so quick and everything's cooking really quick um, in the oven, mostly hands off. I just love, I, I just love um, getting whiffs from the kitchen and um, just knowing that something really tasty is about to come out like in a few minutes. So now that we have our about to roast chicken breasts, and that's all that's going to go in the pan for this recipe. So again, not, not your typical sheet pan recipe. Um, I'm going to do that thing where in cooking videos where they show you your already cooked chicken breast. So here we have my already cooked chicken breast. You can see it's nice and dark and roasty. The skin um, got a little bubbles, bubble action here. Um, what else do you need to see? The skin is a little bit dark. Also, this stuff, this crust on the sheet pan, which is super golden brown, but not burnt. Um, and the juices that are over here that's the stuff that I'm gonna save. So I'm gonna move my chicken. I'm gonna wash my hands for a second. Okay. I, what I'm gonna do. Okay, I'm gonna move my chicken from the pan. Let these cool down. They're actually they cooled down a bit beforehand, so I'm a, I'm kind of flubbing that a little bit, but. Uh, this is, these are the parts that we're going to bang on once they're cool enough. Um, and we're going to deal with this juice to put in our sauce first, but let's build that now. Okay. Okay, so I don't think I've mentioned this yet, but bang bang chicken, also known as bon bon chicken in English, is a Sichuan dish. Um, that was developed at a restaurant in the Hangzhou region. So I did, um, there's, it's a, actually a really popular dish though in Sichuan restaurants. So um, for instance, Fuchsia Dunlop, who wrote The Food of Sichuan or Land of Plenty as it, as it was first published by. Um, <clears throat> sorry, it was developed in a uh, Hanyang street vendors. Um, in the tw early 20th century, she writes, uh, Hanyang street vendors sold chunks of cooked chicken meat draped in a spicy sauce as a snack. The dish became known as bang bang chicken because of the sound their wooden cudgels made when hammered down, bang, on the backs of cleaver blades to help them through the meat. The dish began to feature on Chengdu menus from about the 1920s, Though there are cudgels, uh, though here the cudgels were used to whack the meat directly, loosening the fibers so it could be torn into slivers by hand. The dish appears in many cookbooks, actually, many many um, Chinese cookbooks. Uh, this is this one's actually published by Fadon. It's called China, the Cookbook. 
It was written, co-written by Kalem Chan and Diora Fong Chan. And they just write that Bang Bang Chicken is a chilled cooked chicken dish served with a spicy sauce that was traditionally served in the street markets of the Hanyang district. To prepare it, a mallet is used to pound the chicken breast before it's shredded, hence the name. So this is really fun. <laughs> We're going to bang on some chicken breasts. <laughs> Do you have any questions right now? Yeah, a quick question. Um, maybe you can specify the temperature that you have your oven set at. Yes, I, I think you, I think you must have said to preheat it. Yes, you should preheat it to 450 degrees okay. and then pop it in there. And basically it's going to cook for about 35 minutes. Perfect. So you'll see that in your um, recipe here, which I, I should have mentioned. So thank you for catching that. Yes, no problem. And just as a note to everyone, I will follow up with all of you with an email that will include the recipe and a link to this recording. So you'll get the full recipe soon after today, but we'll stay on track with you, Kathy, for the details. Okay. <laughs> All right. So one thing about um, my book, uh, Sheep Pan Chicken, is that at the back of it, there's about 10 recipes for various different sauces and sides. And one of them is a chili oil, a crispy chili oil, I should say. So this is a really, really simple, it can be as simple as just frying some chili flakes, dried chili flakes in oil to infuse it and then using it, or as is common nowadays, there's some bits of uh, slivered garlic and sliced shallots that is added to it that um, becomes crispy when you basically fry it in that oil along with the chili flakes. So it's a really simple recipe that I have in here for um, crispy chili oil. And we're gonna make it right now. So I have uh, some sliced shallots and garlic that I put in a Pyrex, you can see it right here. And you know, I, it doesn't have to be super thin, but if you get it thin and nice and even and uniform, then it'll probably get crispy easier because I'm going to do this method where we just pour hot oil over it all at once and then ooh, my oil is popping so it's actually at that perfect point where we can add it um, but first I'm going to add my chili flakes now we have I have actually a lot of different types of chili flakes but just to show you that it doesn't have to be like a Chinese chili flake it can be, and actually, if we were going to go for like the really real deal chili pepper flakes or dried chili pepper, um, I would, I highly recommend Fly by Jing. She has the Sichuan uh, chili, dried chilies. Um, they're really big and you kind of have to like uh, take out the seeds or just like crush it up a little bit. But it's actually no problem if you just have like regular red Italian or Calabrian chili flakes, like I have right here. And I'm gonna add quite a lot. Um, you can follow the recipe. I say that one small shallot, one large garlic clove, and these are both sliced thinly with the help of mandolin, um, because it'll help it be uniformly thin. Um, and then I say one to two tablespoons of red chili flakes for medium. Now, if you want a little bit less, you can make it less spicy. You can make it more chili uh, centric by adding more. You can just have fun with it and adjust it to your liking. Another thing you might want to add to it is a uh, ground Sichuan peppercorn, which you can also order from shops like Fly by Jing or the Mala shop is one place you can order online. Um, it's a it's a special peppercorn. It's actually not a peppercorn. It's a berries from the prickly ash plant, and it has a special numbing flavor. So when you mix the numbing flavor, which is called ma, with uh, spiciness from a chili flake, which is called la, you have this classic Sichuan flavor combination called ma la, and that's why you see ma la used a lot in um, Chinese or sorry Sichuan dishes. But for now, I'm just gonna go with my chili flakes and my um, shallot and garlic. And this could be a really all purpose sauce where I don't even have to use it for you know, Chinese foods per se. But the important thing is that you're using uh, a Pyrex 
or some sort of high heat, I'm gonna make sure this is nice and hot, some sort of high heat um, vessel because anything else, you run the risk of shattering as soon as I pour that hot oil in there and that's just like the worst outcome. It can be really dangerous. But once, it, once you hear it popping, that's a pretty good sign. Take it over here. Ooh, that was a good sound. That's what you want to hear. And basically let this cool for a while. Oh, it could also be really like much more eventful too if you have it hotter or if you have your chili sliced thinner, you have more, I'm sorry, your aromatic sliced thinner. Um, so that's just a kind of like a really, a really quickie way to do it. But I actually have my pre-made chili oil that I made a while ago um, in this jar. I actually have a pretty good collection of other spicy chili crisps over here. So this one is called Sizza Daddy, and this is from Eric uh, C from, sorry, it's called Sea Daddy from Eric C from 886. I really like this one. This is a little show and tell. Does anyone have a question? Yeah, I think that there's um, some curious curiosity of what kind of oil you're putting in the chili oil. So I would use a neutral high heat friendly oil. So um, canola is fine, vegetable, uh, peanut oil is totally fine. Um, I wouldn't go with, um, I mean, you could use sesame oil. There's nothing wrong with that. It's just like the flavor is going to kind of die out the higher, the hotter it gets. So you kind of lose the whole point of having the sesame oil. Thank you. Yeah. Um, there's many different kinds of chili crisp. You could have fly by Jinx called the spicy Sichuan chili crisp. That one will have the um, Sichuan peppercorns in it for like that little bit of mala. Um, Here's one that maybe a lot of folks know, Lagan Ma. This is actually, Lagan Ma makes a sauce called Spicy Chili Crisp that is really, really popular nowadays, but this is actually called Chili Oil with Black Bean, which I highly recommend as well. It's just a different variety. It's a little chunky. It has fermented uh, black beans, which are really umami. Um, and then, the folks, this is kind of like a new startup called Magic Sauce from Wander Foods. It's pretty good. This is actually really like not uh, geographically specific. So you, they're, they're not saying that you have to use it with Asian food. You can use it with anything. Um, and it's also not, uh, yeah, it's, it's just very um, versatile. Then I have another one called Tasty AF made by, uh, Aria Forster, she is a uh, she's a home cook and a cooking class instructor. Anyway, you can follow Tasty AF Hot Chili Oil. It's pretty good. Um, that's my little show and tell of all my chili oils. <laughs> Actually, this one, this one is from Sue um, Sue Spicy Chili Crisp, which you can order from Yunhai um, Foods which is a Taiwanese food importer. That one's pretty good too. But you can always make it fresh and it'll be really, really quick and easy as we just did. And the fresher it is, the more flavor it is. So I just, I would just say, go for it and make it, make it yourself from scratch. Excellent, I'm gonna jump in real quick and ask how, about how much oil are you putting in? Or yeah. is the ratio kind of? Right, so high? this is, um, half a cup neutral oil and um, it could be grapeseed, it could be canola um, and that would be for one small shallot, one large garlic clove and one to two tablespoons of red chili flakes. All right so now that we have that we can put together the rest of the sauce because the bang bang crispy chicken recipes sauce is not just uh, crispy chili oil which we just made. Um, we're gonna have uh, a few other ingredients. So basically we're thinning it out with some sesame oil, with some vinegar, with some soy sauce. Um, this is actually, the sauce that is served with bang bang chicken is known in Sichuan as strange flavor sauce. That's a direct translation. 
And it's, it's not like strange in a bad way. It's actually strange in a good way. Like this is a really interesting sauce or this is a really complex sauce because there's a lot going on. It's spicy, it's sour, it's salty. It's, um, it's a little bit hearty. Um, there's just like a wonderful uh, amount of components in this sauce. So guayue ji is um, another way of saying uh, strange flavor sauce. And that's just a Sichuan classic. Um, you can also have strange flavor eggplant, guai wei, uh, xie zi, and other, other, other strange flavor things like maybe a duck or maybe a rabbit. But we're gonna have some soy sauce. Let me show you. Okay. So I will I will tell you the amounts for this sauce. We're gonna have two tablespoons of my crispy chili oil which we just made here. So let me grab my tablespoon. You know, this sauce also is very much like adjust to your own taste. So use this like, uh, use this as like a bare bones guideline. So I've got one tablespoon. Oh. Cool. And along with that, we're gonna have, oh, half a cup of soy sauce. So here we go, half a cup. And I'm using uh, some organic kikoman. Um, you can use any brand you like. And um, kikoman soy sauce is actually shoyu, um, is made with, it is brewed with wheat as well as soybeans. So it has like a sort of clear, kind of lighter colored body, um, a little bit of sweetness. It's a wonderful sauce. Um, let's see, we're also gonna have some black vinegar. So black vinegar is often used in, sorry, <laughs> it is often used in Chinese and in particular Taiwanese cooking. However, if you don't have black vinegar, it's perfectly okay, as I see in this recipe, to use um, maybe a clear rice vinegar, or you can just red wine vinegar or white wine vinegar. Um, growing up, my mom, my mom is from Taiwan, and she would also make a lot of sort of sweet, savory, um, and sour sauces with sesame and with, you know, for cold sesame noodles, or maybe just for cucumbers, like a refreshing garlicky, spicy cucumbers, with a little bit of uh, vinegar. And she just used like red wine vinegar, whatever was the easiest to get her hands on, and it's fine. It's vinegar. But black vinegar, which is this brand I have is actually from Taiwan. It has a little bit more sweetness. It's a little bit lighter on the acidity. So if you can get your hands on it, it's a really nice touch. You can really use a lot of it and it'll add a little bit of sweetness. And now I hear that sometimes they add even carrot juice to, to it um, or a little bit of citrus to give it that uh, distinct sweetness or fruitiness. It's a really nice product. If you can find black vinegar, I highly recommend it, um, especially for this dish, the strange flavor sauce. Remember, there's just tons of flavors going on, a lot of nuances all mingling together in this one sauce, and it's awesome. And now one ingredient here um, is sesame paste, Chinese sesame paste, which is very dark and roasty. It is not at all like tahini, so I wouldn't suggest using tahini as an alternative. Um, but I do say in the, my, my recipe for bang bang chicken and xi pan chicken that the sesame paste is really an optional ingredient because so many recipes, so many iterations of this dish do not have that ingredient in it. And I've seen many uh, cookbooks, I've, I've inquired and I've like consulted many different cookbooks uh, all the time. Like for instance, Cecilia Chang's cookbook, Cecilia Chang, the restaurateur of the Mandarin who just passed away last week. Um, she did not have sesame paste in her recipe for this dish. Um, Fuja Dunlop, who we just saw, um, she, she thinks that it's a, a crucial ingredient. Um, I would say that if you really want to have that kind of creamy body to add to your sauce, and, you, and I think that you should go with the sesame paste. However, um, if you don't have it, I would add uh, peanut butter instead, because peanut butter also has that dark kind of roasty flavor and that earthiness and that savoriness that is a little bit similar to the toasted sesame paste that is used in Asian sauces. 
my mom would also do that. So, <laughs> I mean, it's there's no shame in doing that, I would say. But today, I think I'm going to leave it without the sesame paste because I'm just going to add a lot of sesame oil. Now, this is the stuff that also gives you that roasty, toasty sesame flavor. So, I don't know anyone who doesn't like it also, right? Um, okay, so I said you add one teaspoon. Did you have a question? Did anyone have questions yourself? Um, just that Mary Margaret was hoping you might have a jar of Chinese sesame paste to show us. Around, <laughs> but maybe I, I, I sort of slipped away because I thought maybe she doesn't have any in her kitchen. <laughs> you know, I wish I did. It's, the pandemic has not allowed me to go to Chinatown enough. Mm -hmm. And I have run out and um, I do know Asian veggies.com Asian hyphen veggies.com. They, I got them to, to stock it. Great. Yeah. <laughs> I ran out. Awesome. <laughs> so I think they have it, but you have to be in like the New York area. They do okay. New York and some parts of New Jersey. Um, what are some other Asian online shops? If anyone has a suggestion, um, Please yeah, do great. Throw it in the chat. If you guys have a great source for that, you can throw it in the um, chat. There's many different brands. Lee Kum Ki, which makes a lot of sauces, they have a sauce for that. It's just called sesame paste. Japanese stores will have an uh, Asian toasted sesame paste that you can use. Basically, if it says uh, sesame paste, um, it, it, it'll do the trick. And it, But you probably need to go to an Asian grocery. I haven't seen it in many like supermarkets around here. Perfect. Again, if you're looking for that creamy body and the similar flavor, I would just go with peanut butter yep. as Great. a follow-up. Yeah. So or just use extra sesame oil, which I can find in any grocery store. Yeah. Great. Awesome. Um, cool. So basically this dish is gonna be uh, a salad practically because we're gonna have our shredded chicken with our crispy skin and lots of julienne vegetables. In this uh, iteration, I have your uh, cucumber, and that's a pretty that's a pretty good combo because spiciness. Um, cucumber is always a great um, pairing with anything spicy. It's so refreshing. It'll help cut the spiciness. I like to cut this on a bias, as you can see, and then to create julienne matchsticks, just take a bunch of them, stack them up. And this could be really like rough and dirty. It doesn't have to be perfect. Nobody's judging your knife cutting skills. I stack them up like this in like three piles and I just I just kind of slice through them. And simple as that. Oops. Now, if you have a carrot, which I do, you can add that as well. So where did my carrot go? Here we go. I just peeled this guy. I got it from my CSA and I'm like, okay, time to use up some carrots. Cause I didn't just get this. I got like a whole bunch of these. So I'm saying it's carrot time. And the same thing, just hold it down, slice it. Um, if you slice it as ovals, so on a bias like I'm doing, you just get like a longer area with which to make kind of longer uh, matchsticks which is kind of nice, but it's not necessary. So if you just feel more comfortable cutting in circles directly across the length of the carrot, that's totally fine. Here, I'm just gonna make really simple, make shorter stacks here. And we got nice julienne matchsticks. I also have some watermelon radishes that could be nice, but I think I'm gonna I'm gonna leave it at that because we're gonna move on and show you how to make the the bang bang the banged up chicken. Does anyone have any questions right now? Let's see. I'm just quickly kind of going through them. Um, Terry asked if we had sugar to the sauce, and I did just put oh, the yes. ingredient list into the chat so you can refer to that. And I see that there's a couple tablespoons of sugar in that list. Thanks for catching that. <laughs> Forgot something. Okay. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> we're, we're all working together so, here. <laughs> that's the thing, because like 
strange for the flavor sauce. It has many different components, but you don't have to use all of them. So any kind of iter any kind of combination of these, I'm sure would make a really tasty sauce and you can adjust it to your taste. But we're gonna add two tablespoons of sugar. That's really classic because this is like a kind of sweet, savory, sour and spicy sauce. You can use brown sugar. It only adds a little bit more depth of flavor as far as I'm concerned. Um, we're gonna have some cilantro at the end, but let me move on to my chicken right now. And yeah, okay. We do have one more question, Kathy, that yeah. I think is an interesting question. Graham is asking um, why you choose the bone-in chicken breast. You had mentioned why you like the skin, which I'm with you 100% on that. Um, but is there some difference that you like to have the bone in there for? Well, basically I've never seen a, a skin on, but not bone-in chicken. Right. <laughs> I, I have love either. that. I, I have nothing against that um, for this particular use that is. Um, I do think that it helps kind of maintain the juiciness. Like I worried that it might dry out a little bit. Certainly you can debone it before you roast it, if that's your thing. I find it much easier to debone after it's roasted. And that's what we're about to do right now. Cause chicken breasts are so easy. Like basically we're just talking about that little bit of rib cage. And you wanna make sure that you get the rib, uh, sorry, the rib, the uh, wishbone piece that's just towards the tip right here. There's gonna be a little wishbone. So I'm just, I'm just pulling apart and you don't have to worry about how it looks because we're gonna shred it anyway. So this is not a precision uh, thing. I'm feeling the, uh, the wishbone hanging on here and I got it. Um, of course, this is why you wanna wait until, but basically there, totally deboned uh, piece of chicken. You can just feel it. You, you can make sure that there's no chicken. And I barely, see, unlike with like a thigh or something, I barely lost anything there with that piece. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I really just like this cut. I feel like it's a great compromise because nowadays, um, the whole story with chicken is like thighs, thighs, thighs. It's so much better. It's so much juicier. You can cook it without overcooking. And I love, I, trust me, I love thighs. Um, in fact, one of my first stories for the Know Your Chicken column at Taste was about how thighs were making such uh, a resurgence in the last couple decades, thanks to cookbook authors, thanks to actually changing demographics too, because Asian and other um, minorities prefer thighs to, or dark meat, I should say, to white meat chicken. Like that's that's the quality stuff, that's the valuable stuff. And that's kind of, you're, you're kind of seeing that change um, uh, the landscape of, of recipes. There's a lot of thigh recipes, certainly with roasting but I think that when you roast a chicken breast, you get a little bit of the best of both worlds. You get a crispy skin. It doesn't dry out too easily if you have the, um, uh, the skin on, you have the bones and it's definitely leaner. Um, I think it's great. I'm all for the breast. Okay, oh, that's really good. <laughs> and you get these pieces for the chef. Okay. Did you have a question, Giselle? No, I just appreciated that moment. <laughs> I felt like I'm okay. very hungry. No, carry <laughs> on. <laughs> and okay. I do have a question. Let me throw this in yeah. here while I've got you. Um, with the ginger. Oh, if oh. Are, if you are putting ginger in there, how might you do that? Oh, yeah. Sorry, I forgot the ginger. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> wow. There's so many components in Guayueji that I forgot, like, three. <laughs> Um, so ginger, I love it. Here you go. Um, one of the easy, like one of the greatest things I learned from other cooks and other friends and moms, the friends, moms and stuff is that you don't need to like have a vegetable peeler to peel a piece of ginger. I love taking a spoon because the, the skin is really thin. And, uh, hey, move over chicken for a sec. <laughs> the skin is actually really thin, and if you just hold up a, a, um, a, a spoon to it, you can easily peel it, 
and you can get around the grooves, I think, a lot better than with a uh, vegetable peeler where you're going to lose a lot of the ginger meat. So I would, you know, it's hard to kind of show you guys what I'm doing, but I would give it a try yourselves. And um, it's just a great way to kind of like get all of the uh, ginger out of it because the thin is, the skin is really thin. Once again, it has a very thin skin. And next, because we have this julienne theme going on, it's kind of nice to have everything julienne. So if you have one of the ideals of eating in Chinese food preparation is if you have everything in a long sliver, it's just more pleasing to look at as well as to taste and the texture is, is more, it's just kind of just more harmonized and uniform. And if you have everything in a chunk, like say I have squares of, of tofu or something, it's nice to cut everything else in squares. So you have like a little bit of a chunks, chunky appearance. So because we cut everything here in slivers, I'm going to do the exact same thing where I have these ginger slices on a bias and I'm going to stack them up and make juliennes of ginger. And I'm going to add these to my sauce. You can use as much or as little as you want. Um, certainly the getting a whole piece of ginger in your mouth is like a wonderful, but it's a little bit of a strong flavor. So I wouldn't add like too much. Where's my sauce? I literally can't find my sauce. Okay. Cool. Oh, there it is. Okay. <laughs> All right, we're getting a little crowded here. Um, but yeah. Um, yeah. Did anyone else have any questions about anything that else that I'm missing from the sauce? <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> You're doing great. <laughs> There's gonna be like one more thing. No, nope, I'm taking a quick peek and it looks like we're right on track. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> and of course, you know, the sauce is, is up to your liking. I'm gonna taste it right now. See where we're at. You can add more chili oil. You can add more soy sauce. Oh my God, I really like it right now. Oh, it's got some heat. It's got some sweet and it's got some sesame. Oh, and it's got some sour tang. Oh, it's really good. I hope you guys make it like, is anyone cooking along right now? I definitely think we have people cooking along, hence the, the specificity around the ingredients. So there's, I know at least a few of you folks are cooking along and that's great. Let us know how it's tasting to you. Nice. Okay, we have a special guest. <laughs> I don't know if you guys see him. He's quieter than mine. <laughs> yeah, this is Douglas. Team chicken, but he's going to go away right now. <laughs> All right, so this is my wooden cudgel. <laughs> This is a uh, this is a French rolling pin. You don't have to use a French rolling pin. You can use literally a beer bottle if you want. I have nothing against that. Um, but basically, let me start with one piece at a time. Um, I am going to run over these. And I, you can see, like from just um, you know from taking it apart, I have some shreds already but I'm just gonna gently run over it. I'm not actually gonna bang because I found that the juice can really splatter all over the place. I definitely don't want the juice to splatter all over the screen. But if you guys just do that for one second on one end, you can see how the shreds already like want to shred apart here. So the shreds already want to shred apart. The chicken already wants to shred apart right there. So we have like these beautiful stringies that are just only gonna, here we go. I know this seems like really counterintuitive. I made this whole beautiful chicken breast and now I'm bludgeoning it and smushing it. It's gonna feel a little bit weird, but now I literally don't even have to shred it or pull it apart because it just wants to like really flake. It's like these stringies. And traditionally this dish is like a big pile 
of slivers and it's really like airy and fluffy. It's kind of like, it's like a pile of ribbons. Like, um, so, and, and you can do that so much easier if you just kind of loosen it up right here by not quite banging, but let's say rolling it. That's what we're doing, we're rolling it. Um, and of course I like to have the skin around in like shreds and pieces. Um, you can also slice it up. I don't mind, you know, kind of bigger pieces of skin to, to have um, strewn throughout. Because what we're going to do with this is going to serve it on top of some noodles. I cook some noodles. It doesn't have to be noodles. You can have cooked rice. You can even, I suggested you could have a, a salad if you want to like a carb, you know, low carb uh, meal. You could just have it alone as a chicken dish as part of a multi-course meal. So if I just put this on a serving platter, I topped it with my julienne carrots and cucumbers and um, sprinkled it with garnishes. Here you go as part of a multi-course meal with other dishes, with rice, with friends, with family. It's kind of like a really nice showpiece in that sense. And that's how I would serve it. But let me, let me show you how you put it together actually. We're almost there. Oh wait. I forgot the whole part that I was like bragging about. So see all this crispy stuff on the pan? I'm gonna take my sauce. I'm going to try to get some of that stuff out of here with the help of a metal spatula. So now that I've gotten my vinegar and oils in here, I'm getting the juices and fats from the chicken. And remember, using chicken breasts, you don't have like that much in the way of fat, but you probably will have some crusty Maillard reaction here that just needs a little bit of liquid basically to get it out. And so this is a great way to both prep your plan, plan for cleaning it so you don't have to like scrub it and then lose all this tasty stuff because this is where the flavor is really at. And, and salvage that flavor in your sauce. And usually it just takes a few kind of swipes on each spot that's a little bit crusty until you get it all off. And now I'm going to put this in the bowl. Douglas, don't get it. Thank you. And now the sauce is basically put on steroids. What started as a really good YYG or uh, strange flavor sauce is now like super chickeny flavored five uh, strange flavor sauce. So that's kind of my motto in a lot of the dishes in sheet pan chicken is to use everything you get from the sheet pan. So kind of like maximize the flavors, whether it's soaked in from, let's say squash that's on the same pan or um, Brussels sprouts that are cooking on the same pan or tomatoes on the same pan next to the chicken, it'll absorb the juices the fats, which is delicious. And when you scrape it all up and serve it together, you'll get it, uh, you'll get that wonderful brown stuff and you won't lose any of it. And that's one of the, that's one of the biggest advantages of roasting chicken as opposed to grilling it, as opposed to steaming it or poaching it. Uh, you, you have that nice crusty stuff to use up. So right now I just have some egg noodles. These are like chow mein noodles. I just boiled. I'm going to put together my dish. I, this is like enough for like four people pretty much. This is a lot of chicken. Nowadays, you know, chicken breasts can be quite large. They, they tend to be around like one pound each. Um, but we can talk about that actually later. But um, you know, you can find smaller packs as I have for this one at least, but they can really range. Um, in the front of the book, I have a whole like chicken parts guide as well as a spice guide that walks you through some of the normal um, components or like the kind of definitions of each part and uh, helps you figure out what you need for each. Now, I'm going to add all, no, sorry, half of my five, uh, I keep saying five flavor sauce. It's a strange flavor sauce, Guayway G. Nice sauce, oh my goodness. 
That's that's looking good. It smells good too. Then I'm gonna add my cucumbers. Oh, I'm gonna add a little bit more of the sauce on top of those too, because I, I want them to be nice and dressed as well. I also have some uh, roasted peanuts for toppings, but I like to have a lot of herbs, like a really kind of like fresh and herbal finish for this. So I'm gonna chop up a scallion. Douglas, down, down. Okay. He's like, but it smells like chicken in here. And again, I'm putting these on a bias so that we have that con continuity of the shape, which is kind of nice. You don't have to. I guess I'm just used to doing things on a bias. Um, I'm sure it's just as tasty. It just kind of looks more uniform. Um, and then if you're a fan of cilantro, which I am, you can add it. I just like to have a lot of uh, like a whole shower of fresh herbs on top, but really it's not a big deal. Like if you don't like it, you can add just the scallions or no scallions or no cilantro or no herbs whatsoever. If you have a uh, basil or especially Thai basil, that might be a nice uh, alternate as a topping. There we go. And so my peanuts, my roasted peanuts, I'm just gonna give them a really, light chop, rough chop here. I'm still gonna eat this as well <laughs> in like two seconds. And if you have fried shallots, you can add that. Like that's a kind of typical Southeast Asian topping. Um, I'm gonna add a little bit more sauce and then it's game time. And now I wanna show you guys, how should I show it to you? So lots of chicken filed in there. You can't really see it that well, but uh, and it's all very well dressed because it's been banged and pulled apart and shredded up. And so this gets in all the nooks and crannies. That looks amazing. <laughs> There's pretty good. agreement of that sentiment in the chat too. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> yeah. And you know, you don't even have to have like a whole lot of like weird ingredients in your cabinet you know we just made the chili oil right now from scratch without you know you know with like some calabrian chili flakes <laughs> and shallots um so I, I think it's a really it's a great versatile dish and um and that's why i really wanted to recreate it even though it's not like a faithful adaptation of bang bang chicken where you'd have a really nice cold dish and poached in the in um water or like steamed chicken which is like just the kind of go-to way of cooking. Um, in China, of course, they don't have ovens in most home kitchens in many parts of China, which is not a typical part of the kitchen setup. Mm -hmm. So if the roasting chicken is your de facto way of doing it, which it is for me, I mean, you walk away, hands off you know, for a while, you get to smell it being all roasty and toasty and the golden skin is puffing up then this is i guess how you would how you could or should um approach bang bang chicken excellent um heidi has asked if you feel like the sauce would work with pork which seems like a valid question mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah the wonderful thing about a lot of sichuan dishes is that you have a sauce and it goes with many different things so um strange flavor sauce is just one of them and you can have it in as I mentioned, it could be a cold chicken or other poultry or another meat dish like pork. You could also have it with vegetables. You can you can put a you can put them on cucumbers and have a wonderful salad. Just that alone. Um, yeah. Excellent. Excellent. Sounds like Heidi raises pigs, so that's great. She's got <laughs> some of her own meat. Oh, that's great. <laughs> One thing I love about this recipe, and I wonder if you can speak to this a little bit in your whole book, I imagine your book lends itself to that kind of flexibility of using yeah. what's in your kitchen and the meat that you like and putting it salad underneath if you swap it out with noodles. Yeah. And Yeah, I think that I was writing with the hopes that, you know, like I get a lot of vegetables from my CSA or I might come across a lot of vegetables um, that I just have a, too much of in my fridge at a certain point, or 
I buy things on a whim sometimes <laughs> just for fun. And I think that a lot of the dishes are written to be interchangeable, not just with the um, not just with the vegetables used. And I have a guide for that. You know, if they're firm, dense vegetables like cauliflower or squash, you can interchange them, um, but also with chicken parts too. Um, there's a sort of handy guide of how you can interchange the chicken parts depending on what, what your preference is. Because I found that people are really, people have preferences when it comes to chicken parts and I do too. Um, and sometimes you want to do a whole chicken too. And a lot of these dishes are interchangeable if you want to do a whole chicken and surround it with a few few things. Um, so that's always an option. Excellent, perfect. Like essential Someone, protein, yeah. Yeah, fantastic. Someone did ask about chicken thighs in here. So it sounds like- Yes. Pick up your yes, book. I don't know if I even wrote this in the head note, but absolutely use chicken thighs. Um, the only tough thing is that you might run into trouble trying to take out the the bones if you use bone in. So I would actually recommend doing the boneless because it's really it's kind of tough to take it out the bones once you've already cooked it. If you're handy, you can debone uh, a skin on thighs before cooking. That might be a better. Um, avenue. Got it. And actually, we did do a session with another author a couple months ago who wrote um, a book called Winner Winner Chicken Dinner, and she should have said break down a chicken. So maybe that's a nice predecessor break down the chicken and then come back and yeah. make this dish. We didn't make a dish with her, we just broke down the chicken, and she gave us some good tips on deboning there. It's so economical, usually, to break yeah, down absolutely. chicken, and then once you have the carcass, that's the perfect thing for chicken stock. Uh huh. So okay. all that bones at the end. So you're getting yeah, actually. I, I, would, I used to be stopped up when I found a recipe that needed stock and I didn't have any. But some years yeah. ago, I just started always making stock with my leftover bones and having it in your freezer. And a quick trick to thought is awesome. <laughs> it's great to have. And you know what? When you roast the bones first, which a lot of restaurant mm -hmm. chefs do anyway when they're making stock, that's like that's the plus. So all that the rib cage that we just took out over there. Mm -hmm. Put that in or save that in the freezer until you have a few more of them mm -hmm. and you accumulate enough to make a good amount of stock. Perfect. Perfect for that. So my question for you um, is what inspired you to write a whole book featuring chicken? <laughs> <laughs> I basically have been a little bit religious about like my love for chicken and I wrote like a story about how I loved a uh, cold chicken um, for taste. And that was a story that actually won the James Beard Award for the home cooking category a year ago. And so I think that the editors of Taste and Ten Speed said, we would love you to do this. <laughs> um, so, yeah. And of course, I was just like, this is like the slam dunk sort of combination of topics. It's like a really practical home cooking um, method or formula, which is sheet pan cooking with like the best protein, I think, um, for this method. Um, so it just sounded like a lot of fun, which it was. Excellent, perfect. And I just threw in the link to what I think is the article you're referencing <laughs> so we can all read it over awesome. dinner. That's fantastic. One quick question from Graham. He has a couple of saute sauces from Malaysia and Thailand. And do you think he could do this recipe with oh. other I love that. Yeah, so satay sauces are great. Um, they tend to be, I don't know if you have like a one that has already like peanut peanut butter in it. Um, I think that's a, that would be a great touch. The great thing about like when you're making a sauce for anything, whether it's this or that, I would blend in, you know, I might get, wanna give it a little punch of something else. Um, no shame in that. You should feel free to kind of blend and mix as you go along. Um, one thing that might be good is, um, oyster sauce to add a little bit of thickness and body or hoisin sauce maybe because it has a little bit of sweetness in there so you already got your sugar you might want to decrease the two tablespoons of sugar if you want I mean it's up to you but it's a little bit thicker so it might give you more body if you're looking for that um yeah and just kind of adjust the levers of each ingredient to your liking excellent perfect 
Well, that's it for the questions. And I'm going to let you get to your meal. I, I feel like dynamically I'm sitting across the table from you, which I wish I was so I could share with you. Um, thanks so much for your time today. Um, I think everyone in the chat has really enjoyed this. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you, Douglas. I think you are just what we all needed today. <laughs> yeah. He's getting got a better face. approach to getting the snacks than my very large dog. <laughs> oh. um, Kathy, it's been such a pleasure having you, and I can't wait to try this recipe and check out your book. And thanks, thanks for your time and energy. Thanks. Contact me for any questions you might have, too, at Kathy Airway. <laughs>